All right. The elliptical dilemma, as opposed to the dilemma of making ethyl alcohol on Mars, the elliptical dilemma is getting to where you want to go more than once. I'm Ethan Clifton. I'm an architect. I've been in the sciences. I did the Keck Observatory. I did the Atomic Resolution Microscope. I worked on the space station with Tom Taylor, the central beam concept. I worked with uh, Ben Clark on the Man Mars System Study. So I've been to Mars. And uh, of course, I do a restoration every once in a while, as we are going to do today. And the only place that we can learn this from is, of course, the past. I recommend all of you read Connections. It's a wonderful book that does connect technology and our achievements, none of which are required to be new here, all right? But here we were, it was Pasadena, it was 97, and we're still here. The point of the diagram is that blunt instruments, heat shields, will not give you the precision to make a colony on Mars. Okay, we need an alternative, it must be tested, and it must be understood. No new technology. This is an LZE, all right? An elliptical landing zone, right? Or a landing zone ellipse, as I use. And that results from an unsteerable heat shield. You have no idea where you are gonna come down within, in some cases, uh, some rather enormous dimensions, all right? 98 kilometers. Who here could walk in one of those spacesuits that was discussed earlier for 98 kilometers to get to payload A and then get to payload B, which includes his sodium that he needs to make his butyl rubber, all right? We can't have that. And so they worked on it, and they worked on it. And they got down, and they got down, but they got down to 15 by 8 kilometers. All right? You want to take a day's walk? All right? That has to be improved by an eight-fold level of accuracy for us to have something where we can say there's load A, and I can see load B. All right? And we know how to do this because we know how to blow people up very accurately. All right? You're all familiar with the MIRV. This used to be just one nuclear weapon, and it just sort of came down and blew up as much as you could blow up, all right? And I know this because when I was 19 years old, I had an atomic bomb in a backpack. So yes, it was about smaller than that, but this is the accuracy that we need, okay? We can achieve that level of accuracy. We have done it before. Business. This colonization is either a business or it's just some kind of game that we're going to give up when we get bored. All right? He wants to build butyl rubber there, but these are the things. Colonization is a business. And what business can succeed with a board meeting every two years? We have to give up on the concept of the launch window. All right? We have to get there quicker than that. Flow, it has to be a flow. If we have people there, it has to be a steady flow. It can't be that two-year lump of things. We're gonna have a banquet tonight. This is how you have a banquet tonight, all right? You don't have a banquet every two years. And Mars is a hard place to get to any time, all right? It's way out there, it's in elliptical orbit, you can't even find it with a compass. Hemispheric dichotomy, it's not even round. It's chaotic obliquity, it's like a top spinning at the last moment. It has Phobos and Deimos to get in your way, and it has what's going on now, the dust storm. I have a proposal. Vandenberg and Kennedy can't take the stress of Mars colonization. But, we have Yucca Mountain, tested, understood, and secure. 
your tax dollars have gone into building roads, bridges, tunnel boring machines, and it has a volcanic structure, has room for expansion, and it has isolation, all right? And even better for the purpose of restoration, it's got rusting equipment, okay? This is not where we're gonna go, all right? We're not gonna go from Yucca Mountain to this, what we call in farming, a boneyard, all right? Sojourner, yes, Walking Bed, Brando, McQueen, this is the kind of stuff they like. That's, that's not for us. We're going to where it's comfortable and nice. We're going to Candor Chasma. You can see from the sandbars when Ophir collapsed, it pushed all of that sand out and it probably kept some of the water because when you look at Betis and Candor, the angle of repose suggests strongly that those are supported by a cohesive ice structure. Over here on the right, which has no name, uh, flat plateau, we use that for our landing because a miss is not as good as a mile. Over on Betis, we create an ice mine, and on Candor, the same thing, because we suspect strongly that there is ice right below our feet. Now, civilization, which is what we're talking about, uh, and then ultimately, as the medical teams have talked about, evolution, we're going to have a new civilization of our own. How did we do this before? It took 5,300 years to get to Hawaii, all right? And they had fast boats. It, but it was absolutely a one-way trip, and there was absolutely no guarantee that when they left the Marquesas that they were even going to find anything there but they planned ahead. They did have, and I don't know how they did it, they had a way to contain water, all right? And they had pigs, all right? The smell of bacon will be a sure indicator of life on Mars. <laughs> Let's go to the cichlids. These were swept over by the Scirocco from Africa back and forth, but civilizations were there they did develop self-sufficiency. They had a volcano at Thera. Civilizations were destroyed. These are the things that we face. But they had one thing after being swept off four times from the cichlids. And I got that from Virginia Heinlein, who actually knew that kind of stuff. They created the hydria. This was how they carried water and kept it out there on the islands and conquered the cichlids ultimately. That was the one technology that they had. Now, we have a dark history of taking people places. Eugenics, Irish, candemics. You're in a can, there's disease. Norovirus can take down a cruise ship in a week. All right? How do you keep colonists from sneezing for nine to nine months? Exploration is not colonization. It's a, it's a bold step and you have to do it, but it's always a leap of faith. This is exploration. This is what I did for Martin Marietta. But it's such a tiny bit of information upon which you are then going to send colonists. And this is colonization. That's Yucca Mountain. It takes a big, big investment to make this work. It takes time, money, trust, necessity to do this. And that's where we have to think about buying bonds. We have to pay for this, right? And of course, there's renovation. The highest and best use for the decaying Yucca Mountain facility is to support a Mars colony. We have a massive investment. Let's put it back to work. The nuclear repository, these broken up chunks and that block in the middle is where they were going to put it. They have tested this thing way past any necessity. It's been a political issue and that's, that's the science is resolved. We have 
an existing tunnel dug by this fantastic tunnel boring machine that runs laterally down that ridge line, we can put four guns on that site to launch devices. And those guns came from this man. Who better to look back upon than to study Jules Verne and his gun? We did it here. We did it at uh, Livermore. Gas dynamics, advanced engineering, but it was tested and it was understood for the brilliant Pebbles uh, defense program. I start with a slightly larger one, but we take a four meter cube that you can see a lot of action happens here, and that's all of the pieces that are required are available from current industrial sources. We use sleeves from the basis of design. Uh, they used a 3.2 meter segment. We're using that with a five millimeter liner carbon sheath, as much carbon as you, on the outside as you need for whatever pressure is in that particular section, okay? And you weave them right together the same way we drill for oil. And we start from the top because we're going into the mountain, okay? We're not coming, we're going in. Everything is accessible from the top. And as you can see, this is heavily slotted so that what happens in here, which is going to be a big bang, spreads into the muffler and is captured because we can't give away too much of our material. Then we have the sleeves running down parallel to the barrel. Collimate is so critical. These have to be straight, all right? That is the engineering challenge, keeping these dead laser straight. For cost, we have absolutely nothing on the outside of these sleeves. No fancy technology, no access, no testing. The sleeves are just there and inside the sleeves, we have a dart. And this dart captures electromagnetic pulse in that solenoid, puts it down through there, and it fires lasers down at the bottom, which will ultimately heat your intermediate gas, which is hydrogen. There it is, captured on a sleeve, captured on sears. It sits there locking until you charge it, the blue section with hydrogen, charge the orange section with LNG and air, ignite simultaneously, fire that sucker off. Uniform ignition. I mean, all four of these babies have to go at the same time heating the hydrogen. Now the piston has come down to the top of your high pressure core. The lasers go off and it's just like the fusion reactor. Whammo, that hydrogen is really angry and your projectile is out. The details are just from the basis of design already achieved. But to get the basis of design up to your 11 kilometers per second escape velocity, you have to boost the volume of the pumps and the hydrogen sections. And then the Verne gun, which has a diameter of 1.5 meters instead of 0.9 from the brilliant pebbles exercise, uh, takes even more. But that larger amount of sleeve fits with the barrel if you break it in four. So you have a four-barreled cannon headed towards the sky. And that's how long it is, all right? Think about putting that in the ground. But that's part of the deal. You get that assembled, you fill the hole with the gravel that you dug out of the hole, you compact it, and it's part of Yucca Mountain. All right, it's not going to vibrate, it's not gonna shake, it's not going anywhere. Here's all you need to make it go off. Tons of air, not much LNG, okay? Pull up the rail car, dump your LNG. You need your hydrogen as your intermediate gas and you need CO2 to flood the whole system so that air doesn't meet the hydrogen, all right? You're using the CO2 as the damper 
no air gets near what is very hot hydrogen. And then at the top, after you have blasted this thing off and to keep your hydrogen, you have to have what is a camera shutter that's strong enough to take the remainder of that blast, close it off, seal the hydrogen. You lose a little bit of hydrogen, you lose a little bit of CO2, but you don't lose it all, and you get, of course, the byproduct of that, tons of CO2 to recycle, and it's already hot, and you get tons of superheated water that you can then take your hydrogen, what little hydrogen you need out of that, back. It's a whole cool down, recapture, because you're way the heck off in the, you know, you're, you're way in the desert. Recycling is the way to make this work. And on top of that hole, with all, you know, right under here is your muffler. You've got your crane, you've got your loading dock, you've got a platform at each of these guns. Now, what are you gunning? All right, you need something that is autonomous and completely personless. We use the Biconic that we got from the old case from Mars. All right, it has a great shape and it has the advantage of no power to start arcing out of the atmosphere. It's gonna arc all by itself. So you load it in there, you turn it to the direction Mars is over there, we're gonna shoot over there, we're gonna, you know, you can turn it inside the barrel as you need. And that gives you that early control. Ranging to Mars, and this is where the Biconic comes in again, you're gonna come in all over the place on Mars. The Biconic will come in and turn and maneuver in the Martian atmosphere to get to the LZE. That's the critical direction, and it does this. It has mid-course correction, solid rockets. No liquid rocket is gonna take the kind of acceleration coming out of that one meter barrel. Every tank that you have is gonna burst. But you do have some very robust spherical cold gas tanks because you have to have your tangential thrusters to guide that uh, guy as he flies into the atmosphere from all those angles to get to the LZE. When he comes out of the barrel, he is in a Zabot, all right? The Zabot is the seal. He sits inside there and he blasts out. And what are we taking with us? This is dumb stuff, okay? This is not the fancy, this is not people, this is not, you know, yeah, you need some aspirin, you need, but predominantly, the packing material is not styrofoam peanuts, it's ice, because at Mars, you're not gonna get the water the first day you arrive there, all right? And then solid adhesives and aluminum foil and then some solar cells. And what do we do with Gorilla Glue and foil? We take the sand, we take a form that we ship by a rocket because it's big, and we create the standard chevron. It lets light through, but it stops those ferrous ions like the plus 26s that will just rip you to shreds, okay? So, select the, put the load in the Zabot, select your angle, muzzle load, and let that baby go. It's a simple process, light the fuse, and it's out of there. We have an acoustic bell so that most of the forces are directed upwards, or all of the noise, that's for sure. But we recover the Zabot. We don't waste that thing, and we don't want it to come down in Las Vegas. So it opens up, and it auto-rotates back to Jackass Flats, which is a nice area just south of your site, and you only, then you only need 10 of the Zabots that you refurbish each time because they hit a cactus or a rock. But you refurbish them and reuse them. At Mars, one, rockets are big. Use them only for the critical, time critical loads, all right? High risk, large assemblies. Those have to go by rocket. But the bigger the rocket, the bigger the heat shield, and the wider the LZE, so you have to 
plan to limit what you're doing with rockets because they're not going to come down in your uh, small LZE. And all this other stuff has to be there too. And then because we have an ellipse and we're an artilleryman, right? We will get enough of our dumb stuff into our small ellipse because we use, at the last moment, a directional parachute to get that baby in there. Then we have a little tractor, runs out, finds the load, drags the cable, rolls up the parachute, and we have this landing zone and we put the winch, which is the big heavy sucker that's gonna land from a rocket, wherever it lands, sets the base, but here we are, we pull out the cable from the winch, catch the load, pick up the parachute, come back, drag it back to the winch, and we have a small, waiting for you, all right? Waiting for you at baggage claim is all of this useful stuff, and then we use the winch to bury the human habitats that are first there, like uh, the young man there is burying his, all right? Now, we use the smaller, remember the truss struts? We put those on the ice mines on Bethes and Candor, and we start digging the water that he needs to make his butyl rubber and I need to drink with my ethyl alcohol. <laughs> the money, all right? I'm not asking you for a buck, all right? Not one dollar. But right here on Earth, $1,500 a kilogram for nuclear waste storage. And let me tell you, 70,000 tons of that stuff is just here. This is a picture of Fukushima going off, all right? That, that, that happened. And in Grundy County, Illinois, there are 70, 700 tons of this stuff laying around, just in Grundy. But when the women find out that this stuff is in their neighborhood, they are going to say, take the trash out. And that is what we are going to do. We're going to get rid of it. And after 11 years, because we're getting $1,500 a kilogram to throw this stuff out, we can start paying off our debts. Is there anybody else in this whole project that has said, I know how to pay off the debt? This is how you pay off the debt. And finally, or at the very beginning, this is true, all right? And for those of you who know Carter Emmert, that's her. She needs three kilograms of water and two kilograms of food per day. But we've piled it up there waiting for her arrival. So I can cycle every 132 hours, 1,500 kilograms of stuff, and I can deliver it to Mars for $1,677 and prove I can't. Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Just a couple things. Uh, I think this is brilliant. It's got the bare hallmarks of solving multiple problems at once and getting to the surface with no problems. So I love it. Um, one is, at 132 hours per shot, is there any element of being able to just walk your fire to keep things on target because of the closeness of each shot? The, you will have people controlling. Now, now I'm doing a 132 cycle to Mars, but I have four guns going because we're making money. All right? That's the point, that you're getting 1,500 kilograms to Mars, but you're also paying for it. So the other guns are dumping material into deep space, okay? We've got 11 kilometers per second. We can throw that past Mars and dump the good stuff. But yes, targeting navigation, autonomous uh, directional control, and the beacon on the tractor are, are it. You know, the little tractors out there, I'm, I'm here, I'm here, whack, you know? But that's, that's how it's going to work. Any other questions? Sir. The G-forces on the load? On the, gun, yeah. on the gun, yes. The gun is totally embedded, and it doesn't have the shock absorbers that, because, remember, 
We're fi- on the on the on the, the G forces. This is why I pack in ice, all right. And I only send inert materials, rigid solid materials. So yeah, and the G forces at that acceleration. I'm an architect, okay. There's somebody out here that can tell me what it takes to accelerate to 11 kilometers per second, which I can do in 1,200 meters, all right, which is just gas dynamics. But the G-forces, I don't want to be there. You know, Vern would be laying on the floor of his rocket flat like a cockroach, right? So I I do understand the G-forces, but that's why you stick to dumb, solid stuff. You don't, you know, that, that's the critical element. Any other questions? Uh, Sir? Do you think we can really direct these things well enough? I think we, we've, uh, we, we have the control science. Uh, you know, I, I have enough rockets, you know, solid fuels to get myself into Mars, all right? Once I come into the Martian atmosphere, because I can kind of hit that, this Zabot, I mean, the uh, Baikonic, is going to corkscrew through that atmosphere to get itself to come in from the west into the LZE. But it's going to come in over here. It's going to come in over here. But the velocity is going to be high. This is an ablation uh, surface Baikonic. It's going to burn through the atmosphere. It's going to go low. It can still twist and turn because it has tangential thrusters. So it can, it can fly a very corkscrew pattern before it's slowed down enough, flips around, throws the parachute, and glides into the LZE. So you're going to miss. But what are you missing? You're missing some broccoli, all right? Well, I know, but you know, it seems to me like a little target in the long distance. You don't have any net course correction. No, no, th- th- that's, that's what the solid rockets are for. Well, they're on that. Yeah, they're on, the, they're, they're on it on the back. I've got 31 solid rockets, so I have plenty of choice to make mid-course corrections. I'm just shooting out of the ground, you know, at, no, oh, it's kind of over there. It was there last night, you know? But in the co- it's just coasting, right? So it does have to change its speed. We need pilots to fly it between here and Mars, and we need pilots to land it at the beacon, all right? They need to be able to guide that thing into the beacon. And so you have a, a busy crew. I have about 100 and, I have 120 people per mission, 24 hours a day, right? That's where the money is. It's in the labor costs. But, you know, 20 tons of uh, LNG. I mean, you know, we're full of LNG here. We're full of gas, right? So uh, that's, those costs, the launch costs are nothing compared to the labor costs because we have to run it all the time. So this cost of between the program is up front, and then you're staying on the back end that you'd be able to recover the debt and kind of break even and, and uh, boost the payment from the government for dumping the radioactive waste? Yes. Yeah. So this is net profit. On the net profit that pays down your bonds, OK? This is entirely private enterprise. That's an upfront cost of failure cost, but then on the back end, it's On like the back end, I'm, I'm making money. And, and I have, when I'm through with the first 15 years, I still have 98% of 70,000 tons of these little fuel rods to get rid of before the angry mothers hang me, all right? Because they don't know that stuff is there. Nobody has an idea that this stuff is sitting in a swimming pool in Grundy, Illinois, and upstate New York, and co- they don't know this. When they find out, that they're, they're going to be angry. You talk about radiation on Mars and children, <laughs> you know. Existential threat. <laughs> Yes, a pissed off soccer mom is an existential threat. Sir. I'm sure that 
there is someone who doesn't want me to wing Titan with one of my slugs, okay? Because they'll want to, but Titan might get winged by one of these slugs because I'm not flying those babies. They're headed out at 11 kilometers per second, and I really, I'm like the moms. I don't care where they go. And the environmentalists at Jupiter will object. But they don't know, <laughs> but they don't know I'm coming. Yeah. Sir. Okay, shooting towards the sun, remember, we're in a centripetal acceleration thing, and that turn is taking 30 kilometers per second, all right? I can't make up 30 kilometers per second, so I have to go out. And the only reason I know that is because I was describing this to uh, Robert Zubrin when we first got together, and he said, wait a minute, Ethan, whoa, baby, that's 30 kilometers a second. Go stuff yourself, you know? And I said, oh, 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 okay, no, no, I'm going, I'm going the other way. These, it's 11 kilometers per second to get it out of here. And not, six kilometers a second is orbit. 11 kilometers a second is escape velocity from this planet. So we're we're out of here. When it comes out of that barrel, it's not coming back. I'm just going to point out that I like that the fuel cycle is quick enough. You know, suddenly hitting off course isn't as bad when there's 17 things off course. When, when it's an Easter egg hunt, suddenly a 98 kilometer hike is more justified because you're going to get a bunch of goodies. There's a lot of things. Well, as, as the colony develops at Bonstell, which is the name of the colony, as you know. Uh, people will take one of the little tractors and they will go out and recover one that is 15, you know, 2,000 kilometers away because that particular plateau at Candor is, oh, it's about uh, seven, eight kilometers wide, that particular one. Getting on top of Betis is a much smaller, it's about four kilometers at the top. Candor, probably about six kilometers at the top in that one direction. And that's why you only put the ice mines there, because you can lose an ice mine, you know, I don't know what the heck. But you, the water is right over there, and, you know, you develop whatever system. Your butyl, no, he's got the system. We have butyl hose. We have the water from the ice mines of Betis to Bonstell, and we are living fat and happy. We got the pigs. We're doing good. So the, the thing I just wondered is, worst case scenario on an impact, you don't manage to slow down, the chute fails. I'm wondering, do you lose the whole payload no matter what it is, or does something useful survive and you scrape up? Because that's still way better than trying to break it out of the rock. You scrape up everything. Right. You leave nothing. You have, and you plan ahead. You plan to use every single piece of that. The parachutes, as you saw with the chevrons, you take the shrouds of the parachutes, you use them as the tension cord in the bottom of your chevrons. You use every, you know, but just laying those parachutes out, if that water is down a meter, you're going to get condensation on the bottom of those parachutes, all right? And those parachutes are not conventional. They are intended to become desert stills. You are going to use your coal gas thrusters to store that water. Coal gas thruster, parachute, water. Go around once a week, collect, all right? What's the temperature of impact 11,000 meters per second into a really cold surface? I, I just want to know, like... We're not going to get any pieces out of that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, the, the bro broccoli will be well cooked. <laughs> the, you know, no. If you come in, you have to corkscrew yourself, slow down, yeah. and come in from the west in an orderly fashion. For the guys who don't make it, it's not a loss. I mean, it's, you know, what is a load of tin foil? 1,500 kilograms of tin foil worth. There's nothing in there in the 1,500 kilograms that's worth a buck. Is the next person ready to speak? Okay, well, then why didn't you object? A gentleman and a scholar. Thank you, sir.